Welcome to Still Entitled, the Adam Savage Project. I'm Norm. I'm Adam. And I'm Jen. Jen Schachter, welcome back. Welcome Thank back you. to the podcast. Welcome back to the podcast and welcome back to San Francisco. Um, this is going up tomorrow, right? This is. So, so we are all back from the Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, if you're in the States, of course. I think Canadians had it, what, a month ago or yeah. something like that? Yeah. I'd never. They have a different type of Thanksgiving, but yeah, it was about a month ago. And so the trees are going up now. That's that's traditionally. Ours went up on Friday. That's, that's yeah, exactly it. Yeah, we had a tree it. trimming, little tree trimming party. Oh. You're yeah. ahead of the game. So Totoro, so now in our window um, is Totoro next to our Christmas tree. Oh, that's awesome. And we had some ornaments that were all like little felted foxes and little animals of the woods. So those all went on Totoro. Oh, Be- nice. Because of course they would. Does he have like a little hat or he, something? He has a little leaf hat and many of them are living on the hat. <laughs> that's cute. My recommendation is the fake tree. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you have one? I have a fig tree. And it, it is a buy it is the tree for life. That is right. it. Get one. And and here I do have a regret. If you're gonna get the fig tree and the wire cutter has a great recommendation for the, the company that makes a really great fig tree, I say get the one with the built in LED lights. Really? I know that is not what you normally think. Hmm. No, I, I I I can confirm. I have a fake tree. It go. It breaks into two halves. Second half plugs into the top, and lights are on both sides. And it boop. It all lights oh, up. Wow. This year, for the first time in six years, we're having issues with the light strings. Oh no. Yeah, and there's like a master bulb on each light string on both ends of each light string that kind of, I haven't been able to suss out the problem. So there's like a band in the middle that's gone out. It's just blacked out. However, every year we wrap it up. It goes into a canvas bag. Mm-hmm. It goes into storage. It comes out every year. It's just, it's so simple to set up. I totally agree with the fake tree. Now, I'm assuming if the lights are already on there, it's not the kind that you put in branch by branch and they're all lettered branches. No, no, no. I think that the modern <laughs> Mine's fake on tree. wheels and actually sits, it what? stores upside down. Oh, and that's... so when you break it out of the canvas, you literally do this like whoop 180 flip and it locks in and the top goes shunk and it lights up. Wow. I'm really behind on Christmas tree technology. This this wasn't super cheap. I mean, it was a, at least a couple hundred bucks for this thing. Wow. It's worth the investment because I think that I read a report that like real trees, the price of real trees has doubled in the past five years with the economy. I think the average price for Christmas tree now is like 80 something dollars. Yeah. And in the Bay Area especially, you know, people are paying crazy amounts of money for the experience, quote unquote, mm-hmm. of picking out a tree. And yeah, I think that's totally... Worthwhile and fun. You can get a great tree also at like a Lowe's or Home Depot. You for, can. And not so expensive. But the fig tree technology and how well I appreciate the artifice, what they've done. And they're very load bearing. The branches are mm. all load bearing. That's something that Julia pointed out too, is you can put ornaments way out at the end of things because you can yeah. burp, turn the wire up. Ah. And it'll hold on to stuff. Mm-hmm. And you're totally right. You get a lot more balance. I, look, every, every year our tree looks like a Hallmark card. Oh. Yeah, and, you know. and having the built-in lights doesn't take away from your ability to also add lights. It's just, I think, at least in our household, the, the most frustrating part after you fluff the fake tree mm-hmm. is putting that first strand of lights in and wiring it around. Uh, the most fun part is the ornaments, of course. Yeah. yeah, but it's so hard to evenly space the lights. Like you That's start hard, you yeah. start wrapping them and mm-hmm. you think that you have enough and then you get to the top and it's right, or it's like way too dense at the yeah. top. By the time we stopped using real trees, I it took six strings to achieve a level of light, satis- of, satis- of me being satisfied with the lighting. And I actually, I, this is a whole bit in the book, <laughs> but um, the way I would... I wrapped it up one year is I walked around with a poster tube wrapping up the lights on the poster tube. Ah. And then every other year, all I had to do is walk the opposite direction around the tree at the beginning of the season and the opposite direction on the, at the end of the season. And it was ready to go. Go the thick poster tubes that you yep. get for like the 24 yeah. by 36 like four posters, inch, yeah. four inch ones, really, have a little yeah. notch so you can put the plug in at the top <laughs> and you can fit many strands on that. But you're right. The spacing is tough, especially if you have light strands that are like multi-pattern mm-hmm. for some reason. They're not, they're too evenly spaced. So when you spiral it around the tree, like the lights, the same color lights stack on top of each other, which oh, you don't want. Yeah. Oh. You yeah. want it to be broken up. Yeah. yeah. Who uses colored lights on a tree? I, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm <laughs> traditional. I, I use the white. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the holidays <laughs> officially. And last time we had you on the podcast, Jen, you had just moved to San Francisco. You guys, of course, had worked on Project Egress mm-hmm. together. That was a big thing. And uh, how have things been? 
Uh, things have been good. I feel I feel like I live here now. I feel adjusted because <laughs> I got here and it was like immediately dive into into egress and um, that whole. We threw you into the one. deep end between yeah. Savage Builds and yeah. egress. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I didn't get out much, let's say that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I feel like I live here now. Um, we got a spot uh, over in Oakland, so I've get, I get to be here in the city for, for work every day, and I get to explore some of East Bay, too. And um, we did a little bit of a northern, on the way up to Northern California, like Napa and Marin and all that stuff recently, and it's it's gorgeous out there. It's amazing. I mean, as a transplant to San Francisco, uh, are, are there things on your bucket list of things to do, or do you feel like you can wait? because now you live here. Like Alcatraz is the, the famous example, right? It's, it's Alcatraz is totally worth it. Highly doing. recommended. Book early, because you, if you're going to be here for the weekend and you haven't booked tickets, you probably won't be able to get tickets. But now that you live here, what are the things that you like or that you found that you want to do in San Francisco? Um, it's interesting, because I've, I've been coming here for a long time. Like I, I visited family out here like 15 years ago, and I've been coming. So I've done things like Coit Tower. And I, we never did Alcatraz, actually. Um, but we did like Mayor Woods and... Um, Oh, gosh. City Lights Books is still one of my favorite places in, in the whole city. Uh, so I've got a, l a little bit of the tourist stuff under my belt already. I'm trying to think if there's anything that I really wanted to do that I have not done yet. Um, let's see. We did, like, fireworks up on uh, Twin Peaks for Fourth of July, and you can awesome. see out over the whole city. Yep, it was, yep. like, foggy up there. It was, <laughs> it was really dramatic. Um, and, of course, there's a ton of stuff going on around the mission around that time. Yeah. Uh, I miss the Day of the Dead uh, festival that goes on right after Halloween that's here in the mission that's just like really phenomenal. Have you guys been to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's fun to kind of like happen upon it sometimes too. Mm. Like you're ready true. to go get a burrito on mission and yep. suddenly there's a big parade. Like, oh, it's the Day of the Dead festival. Mm. And it's just wonderful just to stand around and watch. Adam, what are your big recommendations? I know we promised people some, some picks for people who may be traveling to oh, the Bay Area yeah. over the holidays. Uh, Twin Peaks is great. You know, someone asked recently on Twitter and I said, do a Google search for secret staircases of San Francisco. Ooh. San Francisco has dozens of staircases. So if you have a, any kind of high hill where driving up is, you know, uh, an adventure and there's tons of, because of the terrain here, there's tons of places like that. There will also be staircases for pedestrians that might not even go through the normal streets. Huh. Uh, and they're often these wonderful little jewels of small enclaves you didn't know about, where you walk up through a neighborhood on the south side of Twin Peaks or over near Lyon Street mm -hmm. uh, and get to see views in the city you wouldn't normally get to see. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they're fun hikes. Um, the last time I did it, my mom was in town and we actually ended up running into the flock of parrots that mm -hmm. live in San Francisco. Oh, yeah. The noisy buggers. Um, I, I'm a big fan of the secret staircases. I obviously I love I love Alcatraz. Um, you know, a, a day spent hiking the Marin Headlands, hiking Mount Tam, hiking Angel Island are all three wonderful dates you can spend that you really won't forget. They're all three remarkable. Uh, views, beautiful landscapes, all very different, all very mm. San Francisco. Do people usually rent cars when they visit San Francisco? Is that, is that a thing? I don't know why you would. Yeah, I know. I mean, Driving I mean, here is awful. Exactly, yeah. it is. So um, to get to the Marin Headlands or to get to Pacifica yeah. or get to Santa Cruz, you know, now, the car. Now you guys were both out of town, but I want to tell you that the last 10 days of San Francisco have been so empty of cars. <laughs> it has felt like San Francisco in 1992. It's just been glorious. We've we've been driving just because. <laughs> Let's just get out and see the streets exactly. where we can't normally go. Drive um, in a one-wheel tour of the city. Yes. Nice. Yeah. yeah. How, uh, how, where did you travel for Thanksgiving? I home? went to Indianapolis. Okay. Took the baby. Uh, Dan and I took the baby to back to her home, which is Midwest. Uh, long flight. I think six hours with the layover, um, you know. How did the kid do? Okay. Yeah. As, as well as kids can, can yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's no good pose. Yeah. The uh, baby, when, when baby goes limp on an airplane. Yeah. And you're just hoping that he stays stays uh, stays out for the whole flight. Uh, we thought the entertainment center behind the seat would be a great thing, right? Put on a movie, a Disney mm -hmm. movie or something. No, not a completely distracting thing. And you can't turn it off all the time because they'll do announcements and then the screen comes on and then the baby just wants to touch it. Oh. Touch screen all the time. Yeah. yeah. That, 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 I ran into that recently where the screen just would not shut off or every time an announcement it would stay on and I'd just be like, I, I, I. Yeah. Were you the one telling me about the iPad? 
No. Well, Somebody was telling me that they were getting, they got on a plane recently. Maybe it was Will Smith. And the person next to them pulled out an iPad and a roll of blue masking tape and they taped their iPad what? to what? the seat back in front of them and watched wow. that. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's, uh, there's got to be a better solution for that. Like some type of seat over seat thing. A with better a solution or a merit badge because that's <laughs> hardcore DIY yeah. to show up with a roll of tape and tape yeah. to well, the plane. Well, you know plane. it's not going to last forever. No, just enough yeah. for the flight. Yeah, I have a lot of respect for that. Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> blue masking tape. Yeah, you're really laying out there for the flight attendants. Um, now, like one of the least controversial things to do with your family is to watch movies together. Mm -hmm. I'm, we're actually specifically my mom's coming out for Christmas. My mom sees everything. So we're like, Mom, you can't go to the movies in December. We need you fresh when you arrive here so we can all go to the movies a whole bunch. I guess I'm telling her now because she watches the podcast. Aww. But we said this. Anyway, um, did you guys watch any cool, anything, any great things over the weekend, over the holidays? Uh, I did watch uh, I did watch the movies on the plane. I watched Ghostbusters for the first time, the original for Ghostbusters. For the first time! Yeah, the I'd never seen one. it. Yeah, I managed to have never have seen Ghostbusters by now. Um, it's really bizarre. I did not... I <laughs> wasn't expecting it to go the direction that it went. Um, um, you found uh, Bill Murray's Ray Stance. Uh, you found his character just a little problematic these days. <laughs> yeah, I was. I wasn't prepared for his level of like cringeworthy womanizing. Womanizing. <laughs> like, I was like, is anyone else seeing this? Like he's really kind of like, oh, and she falls for him. Like really? That was the part that surprised. Me. I was like, his character is whatever he is, but the the fact that she goes for him in the end, I was like. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also started watching uh, I Am Mother, uh, oh, which is, yeah. I didn't finish it because the plane landed, but uh, really, really good. Oh, my gosh. With our friend Luke Hawker as the robot. Is that who was inside of it? Yeah. Yeah, that practical suit, which uh, what a workshop made, of course. Uh, they made just the one, I believe. Yeah. But it's a like a, a 3D printed suit. titanium, all sorts of custom built stuff. It's an amazing costume. Up close, it looks even better than it does in the film. Wow. And I, it looks amazing. I think I, because you guys did a piece on um, what it's like to act as a robot, right? Mm -hmm. I think I had that bookmarked yeah. and I was like, I need to watch the movie before I watch this behind the scenes thing about it. But uh, yeah, I, I haven't actually finished it. So don't tell me how it ends. But, oh, very exciting. Um, yeah. It's cool too. I I rewatched Space Odyssey for the first time in a really long time, and the the moments of the eye of uh, of Mother are such a throwback to Hal. It's like yes, there's there's yes. a lot of really cool throwbacks in there. Yeah, uh, Mandalorian. Yep. Continuing on that. Yep. Um, the I love the last episode was yep. basically Magnificent Seven, or at least like the major plot points of. Right. And and there's this online kind of discussion, I'll call it that, about its influences. And people are saying, it's a Western, it's a Western. No, it's not a Western, it's a samurai film. These Those are, two things are completely conjoined in yes. American film because yeah. because of Kurosawa and uh, Sergio Leone. Right. And, and the most recent episode, which I believe was uh, directed by Bryce Dallas Howard, uh, that one is it's essentially Last Samurai. Uh, Last but, Samurai? Oh, yeah, I guess right? it is Last it, it Samurai is, is or Magnificent Seven without the Seven. Exactly. Right. It's the right. Magnificent Two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's Gina Carano who plays the, the heavy on uh, that. Gina Carano struck me as I kept on wondering if it was my television or if they'd done some post processing on her because she looked a little. Like when you first see her in the episode, she's framed in such a way that she looks a little like a, like a CG character from a video oh. game. I don't know if it's and, costuming. Or... Yeah, that might have just been some digital post-processing they mm. did, you know, like on the frame or, or, or could have been a setting on my television. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I also love that the third episode, that's uh, the one by Deborah Chow. She's the one who, a uh, director who's now tapped to do the Obi-Wan series. And I'll, I know people, some people haven't seen the show yet, but that one is my favorite episode thus far. It's a terrific, terrific episode. Yeah. Um, they've all been, and they're like nuggets. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It feels radical to see high budget, uh, high level science fiction in 30 minute increments. Yeah, that's, that's mm -hmm. the thing, right? It can, it's, it doesn't need to be an hour and a half and they can, it feels like a comic book. Yeah. Yeah. Like episodic in the, in exactly the right amount of pacing. Are you, are you watching anything right now that you're obsessed with? Am I watching anything? Um, 
I'm I'm about to start watching the new season of or the final season of Vikings. Have either of you guys watched this? I have not. I although think Gunther I, over at the tested office watches it. Gunther and I have nerded out about it. Um, it's it's definitely, I've heard it's great. It's fantastic. The, Is Donald Logue still in it, or who he, was he only in the first season? I think he was just what a character. Um, I don't know what character. Okay. He's, I mean, a big bearded. Well, I guess they're all <laughs> big bearded that's, dudes. That's all <laughs> but the framing of the show, it's it's a History Channel show, so it's not just the dramatic portrayal is that correct that it's a mix between that and some historical narration yeah there's oh is there really uh well there's it's not it's not like docudrama style like it's it's very much a you know it's a scripted scripted narrative mm. but there's a lot of stuff i mean they the various different cultures around at that time you see where they encounter each other like there's one scene where the vunk, the vikings invade a monastery and they've never seen paper before because <gasps> there's all these illuminated manuscripts and they're just like having a blast setting fire to all the paper, but they're also like, they just discovered paper. Like they've never seen paper <sighs> wow. before. Um, there's there's some really neat stuff. And the the lead female character is this uh, Norse woman from the sagas, Lagertha. And she's like, my fa- hands down my favorite female character in anything I've ever seen. She's really? like, I, I cannot give a bigger endorsement. She's incredible. The acting, the writing, like it's incredible. Ooh, yeah. that sounds awesome. It's worth awesome. watching the show just for this one character. How many seasons is it? That, uh, I believe the final this is the final season. I think this is season six. Jesus. They, they get, because they break it into parts, so it'll be like part 5A and B. Right. So I'm not sure if this is 5B or 6, but. Got it. Yeah, check it out from the beginning if you if you haven't watched it yet. Adam and I are both thoroughly enjoying Watchmen. Watchmen, the last episode, has a huge cliffhanger of an ending. Is it? Is it only six episodes this season? Or are uh, we... So last, most recent episode was episode seven, for those of you who So I found myself wondering if it know. was, if eight and would be the will last be two one. more episodes. Two more. I believe it is nine, nine episodes this season. The cliffhanger at the end of this week's episode made it clear we were only one or two episodes from the end. Yeah, and that makes me a little sad. Yep, I will. This is a really important show. It just feels really important from a social commentary. Um, and we've talked about this in the past. Science fiction provides a really excellent way to get past people's political filters. Yes. And some of the most like intense class-based commentary happened on Battlestar Galactica. All good uh, science fiction is yeah. commentary. Mm-hmm. Uh, famously, Star Trek. Um so this uh, Watchmen's really good. I'm watching. Uh, I'm loving his Dark Materials. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, 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 the Morning Show remains uneven, <laughs> half terrible, half great, and it really does ride between these two poles of like there's dialogue, and you're like, who wrote this terrible dialogue? <laughs> and other scenes where you're just like, oh my god, watch these people do great stuff. Uh, what are the movies you're going to watch with your mom, or that you guys are have pegged for watching this <sighs> this December? We really. Uh, 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 Knives Out? I don't... Yeah, Knives Out, definitely. We're going to see with her. We want to see Parasite, which we haven't seen yet. Oh. Very excited about that. Have, have you heard of this? No. Parasite is um, from the director... Bong Joon-ho? Korean, yes, Bong Joon-ho, South Korean director who did The Host, as well as Snowpiercer, and a Netflix film, Okja. And I, I'm not going to give anything away. There's Just Go into a cold... <laughs> And it is a thriller. I don't know it's, anything it's, about it's a, it. It's a thriller. Okay. Yeah. I know in the poster there's people who look happy and one person's upside down. That's all I know about the movie. <laughs> that, that's about it. That's about that's right. That's about to know. right. That's about all right. right. Um, yeah. I, 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 just for a second, I want to talk about um, Mandalorian and the helmet. Mm. Mm. Okay. This is something that I've uh, am really impressed with because the character never takes off his helmet. Right, I've been hearing about this. And it's clear that it's a plot point, right? It's part of the religion of the Mandalorians that they don't take off the helmet, as we just found out. Um, and they're Publicly. Publicly. He, he takes right. it off there to are conse- yeah. Right, there are consequences to publicly taking off the helmet. This is the way. And as such, you have a, an actor, Pedro Pascal, who has to do the performance at, like, mask work, right? Totally inside an armored costume. And he does an amazing job. But then you spend a tremendous amount of time on the series looking at this helmet because it's the head of the main character. Um, and in any other context, it would be silly to have a lead character in a drama have dramatic dialogue exchanges while all they're doing is the physical movements of tilting and nodding their head. Well, and, and, and you know, famously, uh, one of the most famous cases of this is the portrayal of uh, V and V for Vendetta. Mm. Yep. Um, 
the performance was not even done by Hugh Jackman. Hugo I, Weaving. Hugo he, Weaving. He, yeah, yeah. For, right. If I remember correctly, he's just, dubbed, he's just the voice. Yeah. So they hired really? a dancer, I believe, uh, a, a physical performer to do that work. Um, I find the helmet super compelling. It's a beautiful piece of design because it looks different in different shots. Mm -hmm. It has... Uh, I think that they really worked so that it did change its look so you really could get uh, a whole... I'd love to see a featurette on the design mm -hmm. and implementation of the helmet because it's a m beautiful piece of, of, of execution. Well, you talk about it being a plot point with defining the character, but the material itself is a plot point because the whole point is that he's finding this Beskar steel, which right. is the currency and the thing that's part of their their lore, which has a sheen and a reflectivity to it uh, that's on his armor, yeah. starting with the helmet. And so it's almost like, you know, in, in Watchmen, we talk about the character Looking Glass. And yes. His mask is also very reflective, and there have been these analyses and, 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 and interviews showing, talking about how that is, while it, conveys a material yeah. it is not of a real material no they mm. augment it and, oh not and only do they augment it there's there's only one reflective material hood on the set and that's just for reference mm -hmm. from what i understand it's tracking mm. markers i and might have figured out a way to cosplay looking glass Ooh. um that is to my satisfaction knowing by the way that i hate it when you can see where the operator is looking out from and so on Looking Glass's, the problem with doing Looking Glass's hood is that it's fully reflective and you can't see out of any super reflective material. I've been ordering them for weeks <laughs> and everything I've got is either not reflective enough or if it is, you can't see out of it. I right. think I have a solution. And so much of that is environment that you can't control. They control when they're filming this, right, the environment, right. the lights and the places that they put Looking Glass in. When you're talking about a costume or cosplay, you are in some of the best lighting environments in a studio or a photo shoot or some of the very worst lighting environments in a convention center or right, outdoors right. or in the rain. And same with The Mandalorian. They chose a, a, a sheen and a reflectivity so that it looks heavy. It looks, maybe not even heavy, mm -hmm. but it looks like it has importance and weight. And, and yet it doesn't betray like the filming of it. Yeah. I am curious as to uh, how much I'm curious as to whether the Mandalorian's helmet is actually metalized or it's a paint treatment. I mm. believe it's a paint treatment. I think so too. It, it's just a really, really good one yeah. because it feels totally like a metallic. Right, and 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 you know if you've seen the helmet and you know what Boba Fett's helmet right, is like, that's it's a big helmet, right? Yep. It, it, the uh, neck is revealed, and so it has the risk of it bobbling, which would ruin the entire persona of the character. From what I understand from the research I've been doing online, the helmet for the Mandalorian is slightly smaller than Boba Fett's helmet. It mm. is made to fit very closely on the actor's head. Mm. Um, and that's, again, it would be great to know about how these decisions all got made, because I'm sure the size of the helmet was something they experimented with. They did lots of camera tests with. The whole show is going to rest on the performance and how this guy looks you got to try all these different things out. There's some wonderful early lighting tests of the Hellboy makeup you can find of oh. Ron Perlman just like holding a light bulb around his makeup face, you know? I mean, both of you are wearing amazing jackets. And of course, <laughs> you're wearing uh, a jacket from Blade Runner. Inspired, right? I'm wearing Deckard's trench coat. But Jen is wearing <laughs> an even cooler jacket because you can wear that out on the street and not look crazy, <laughs> although it's definitely like kind of referencing... This yeah, I, I came in wearing this today, and Adam just got that. I'm all like, where like, did you get that great coat? <laughs> but that's the thing. We look at costuming in film, and you've had great conversations with costume designers who, when they draw out a silhouette, rarely do you have something that's exactly what they drew get put on screen because oh, yeah. they're things that they can't control. Mm -hmm. You know, the proportions of the actor. Mm -hmm. right? Real people have hips, and real people are, are, are proportional in a certain way. Not everyone's going to be a six four you know, perfect specimen. Mm -hmm. uh, and same with the fabric material. So that is a really curious and interesting thing. And I love the fact that the men, like Boba Fett's always been super compelling. And one of the, one of the main reasons is that armor is so mismatched and there's all these different, what is the story behind that? There's a great narrative. And you do this with even minor characters. You you build narratives into the, into the as we've talked about, into the construction and into the painting. But the Mandalorian makes manifest exactly why Boba Fett's suit is multicolored, how mm -hmm. the Mandalorian religion and uh, culture works. Yeah, some of my favorite shots in the show so far is when he's just resting. 
just sitting. Yeah. Right. And the way the armor still looks yeah. so cool and so weary. The way the, the his big his uh, rifle. He, yeah. Oh, I love that him. rifle. Yeah. Hey everyone, Norm here. Before we continue on with the conversation this week, I want to let you know that Still Entitled is made possible with support from Netgear Orbi Wi-Fi 6. Is your Wi-Fi feeling old? Does it buffer while streaming? Does connecting new devices slow down? Can it handle gaming, video calls, large file transfers all at once? It doesn't matter how fast your internet connection is if your Wi-Fi router is old and outdated. With Orbi Wi-Fi 6 from Netgear, your Wi-Fi will feel new again. Wi-Fi 6 is the latest tech that allows more or devices to connect and stream simultaneously without impacting speed or reliability. The result delivers the fastest Wi-Fi for all your devices anywhere in your home. You can stream in HD, 4K, or even 8K without buffering and eliminate lag while gaming and connect more devices to your Wi-Fi than ever before. Orbi Wi-Fi 6 is like upgrading your Wi-Fi to first class. And if you're ready for that, best Wi-Fi ever, you can get it today from Netgear and never worry about Wi-Fi again. Check out Orbi Wi-Fi 6 at your local Best Buy or at netgear.com slash best Wi-Fi. That's netgear.com slash best Wi-Fi. Now on with the show. Uh, okay, so we've talked a little bit about science fiction. I want to go back to what you guys ate on Thanksgiving. So uh, Jen, yeah, what was what was your Thanksgiving meal? Th the dinner like? Uh, it was it was pretty traditional. Yeah. Um, I went over. We have a friendsgiving every year in Baltimore, and uh, I went back to to go do friendsgiving. Oh, nice. Uh, I underestimated how long it actually takes to prepare because I've never been there from start to finish. But like, my friend put the turkey in at nine a.m. and we ate. We sat down to eat at 9 p.m. And oh, there was wow. like the whole house of friends was cooking and prepping. And there are two kitchens in this house. So we were running up and down three flights <laughs> of stairs like, who's got the mashed potatoes? OK, they got to go in this oven and bring the pie up there because they can't be at the same temperature. And it was fun. It was like a good friend bonding experience. But yeah. 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 Same here. L lots of traditional foods. Thanks. Uh, turkey, pie, scalp potatoes, the green beans, all that jazz. Nice. Yeah. Uh, Julia, uh, she did a lot of prep cooking in the in the couple days before. So on the day of, we had a Friendsgiving uh, and it was very low key and delightful. Um, I made mashed potatoes. I tried a new wrinkle on the mashed potatoes, which was to three quarter roast them huh. before boiling them and mashing them. Skin on or no skin? Skin on, always skin on. Good. I'm a big believer in potatoes. <laughs> well, flavor. Skin is, right. Roasting um, gets you the Mayer, May Mayard effect. Mm -hmm. um, so you get the little caramelization. Yes. And then you boil them. It's a, just a bit of a richer taste. Nice. Mashed potatoes is the one dish I do without any recipe. I just yeah. sit there with enough butter and salt and yep. sour cream and kind of make it work. Taste it. And it's, more butter. More that's, butter. My, that's my favorite. My wife made some gratin, which we didn't even get to. So we got that to look forward to, I think, tonight. Um, I have even... Oh, my favorite innovation was uh, Julie wanted to do... Did I ever tell, to say this story on the podcast? I don't know. About the Zuni chicken? No. Oh, so we love... We eat Zuni chickens. We eat chicken in Zuni's recipe all the time. What is and, that? Um, it's a three-day salt brine followed by a specific method of cooking in a skillet in the oven, hmm. but turning the chicken frequently. And what does that get you? It gets you really tender, really crispy, tasty chicken. It's mm -hmm. fantastic. You can look up, I think Cooks Illustrated has a problem-solved version of Zuni chicken recipe. It's a stunner and it's not hard. Is the trick the skillet? It collects the The trick is the skillet, but also the brine. Okay. Um, Three-day salt brine. It's a dry mm. salt brine. Mm. Um, so Julia was thinking maybe this would be great for turkey. So she bought a big turkey breast and cooked it that way. And no, it wasn't great. <laughs> turkey sucks. Turkey's not great. <laughs> so she turned the turkey breast into a stock to make an amazing turkey gravy, nice. which we served with chicken. <laughs> Chicken for Thanksgiving. We had chicken yeah, for Thanksgiving. Sure, you have turkey in there somewhere. It was great. Um, my and my sister and my brother-in-law came up, and I haven't spent we haven't spent a lot of time together in a in a while, uh, and that was just fantastic. Their dog Ziggy came up, and Ziggy and my dogs got along great, and I kind of really. <sighs> I kind of fell in love with having two dogs, three dogs in the house. Uh oh, wow. yeah. I got. Uh, wow. It just it was really All right. It was, there was something about the pile on of three dogs that just felt awesome. 
Look, I love dogs. More dogs is better dogs. <laughs> you only have so many nooks for them to sneeze, squeeze into. I'll, they can have all of them. They can okay. have all of the nooks. All of the nooks. <laughs> all of them. Um, That's the dream. Uh, I know there are a lot of projects that you guys have been working on in the shop here that we cannot talk about. Yeah. But there are some that we can talk about. Jen, I'm staring at one right now. You, while I think, while Adam was traveling for the expanse, you worked on this incredible uh, cart. Mm hmm. For the cricket. Can you tell us about, get, paint us the word picture because we will do a video about it, but paint us the word picture. Uh, it's, uh, how do I describe this? Uh, it's just, it's a simple plywood cart that kind of fits into the. I will yeah. say that we recently have been utilizing the, cre do you say cre cut? Uh, the cricket? The cre I say cricket. I All say right. cricket too, but I don't, I don't know. We're not sure. Y'all know what we mean. The cricket uh, vinyl cutter. It is a consumer version of a vinyl cutter. It's only a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. Yeah. It mm -hmm. goes on sale all the time. The cricket maker is the model. Mm -hmm. um, Kate Sabaker introduced us to it and it is, it's fantastic. It's a revelation. It, it really is. And the degree to which, like if you were going to get one rapid prototyping tool for a home maker shop. Honestly, uh, 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 I think it's Cowboy Crunchy was showing us, Cowboy Crunchy cosplayers were showing us that they were using the Cricut cutter on one millimeter sticky foam uh. in layers to do a gold brocade that was like phenomenal. Basically, it's the one, if you, if you can only afford a couple hundred bucks for a maker tool, this is the one to get. Mm -hmm. And we had been using it on a fair bit of projects. And I said bef uh, before I left, hey, we should have a rolling stand for this thing. You see how I like to make rolling stands. Mm. Go ahead and make something like that. That's all I said. <laughs> and you went and took me to rolling stand school because this is the best <laughs> rolling stand in the shop. Oh, thanks. Oh, yeah. Um, it was weird because normally I do a lot of, like I sketch everything out before I go to a build. But this one I was like, I'm just going to I'm just gonna hold the pieces up and see. And I was like, built the, the outer structure <laughs> and then figured out where the shelves should fit in based on putting stuff on there. But... Yeah, there's a, like there's a little home for everything. Every tool that oh you need, there's a little so satisfying place for it, and drawers, and the mats hang on the side. But yeah, I, I'll I'll draw something up now that it's been made with measurements and all that. That's it's just a fabulous addition to the shop, and I think we, you know, it's a trick. The question is, do you put a plex cover on it? Mm. Because if oh, you do, lid. well, if you put a cover on it, then you're gonna put stuff on the cover. Yeah. Right. So maybe it needs a clear vinyl cover, not a plex cover. Oh, so like a soft cover. So we like don't stack. Or like a typewriter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or we make a plywood cover for it and turn it into, a, you know, an extra work storage surface. Could be. Oh, I don't think you need a cover at all. It's so inviting. The cricket sits, the machine sits on top of mm. this cart. It nestles in and you have these handles on the side and it unfolds because the way it works is like you flip open the lid and you then put on your vinyl sheet 12 by up to 12 by 24 and it's inviting to um, use the way it's set up yeah we're it's gonna do a video on it we're gonna have you walk through and do a little project because yeah, yeah it's a great cart it's yeah. just fabulous and adam last week uh while we were out on thanksgiving break you spent some time in the shop and we'll again have a video on this but you were delighted by a a little project you made a, a lantern project oh my god yes so we're gonna do this I, I have two projects to tell you about one was uh, for a, a soon to be revealed build, uh, I needed a ye olde lantern, like the kind that would be mounted to the front of a Model A Ford. And I bought a, I bought one online and I lit it up with a LED bulb. That's all I'm going to say, but it is one of the most satisfying objects I've made in a long time. And actually it's been in our house because I brought it home and I showed it to Julia. She's like, this is amazing. We got to just keep this here. Um, that's the thing that's so striking about the story. It wasn't something necessarily from scratch, but you turn a simple, cheap thing off the shelf and, into a way cooler thing. And your and and the, the iterative upgrades, right? Like from from electronics to finishing, like you, every bit you added gave you a level of satisfaction. To a point, the culmination you're you fall in love with. I'm totally in love with this thing, and I'm like walking around the house with it. Again, it's it's just a lantern that looks like it's got a fire burning in it. But the all of this stuff I bought on Amazon, it's none of it's that cheap. None of it is really difficult from any perspective for a hmm. person to implement. So we're gonna do a one day build that you could almost free roll because yeah. I, it's not gonna be longer than. 90 minutes of construction getting this thing up and running right. and all out of plywood and store-bought stuff. Yeah. But I did another project this weekend too. Mm, what was um, that? I, uh, uh, I don't think we've done a video on the chips I have from Rounders. 
The one that's set. The we, ones that yes, sit over yeah, here. Did yeah. we did we ever cover that on the Maybe. website? Oh god, we've been doing this for a long time. Now. I know. <laughs> Let's just assume for sake Let's of assume we, we no. haven't. So we're gonna do it. Uh I love the movie Rounders with Matt Damon, uh Martin Landau, and Ed Norton, uh John Malkovich, John Torturo. Phenomenal poker movie. You actually just watched it recently. Yeah, I randomly. Yeah, yeah, randomly I came across it. It's one of my favorite movies. I've watched it uh, many, many times, directed by John Dahl, who uh is now does a lot of television directing. And um, I, years ago, managed to uh, just have made by a poker chip company uh, a really accurate set of Teddy KGB's poker chips. One thing I am not going to reveal is who made the poker chips because they asked me not to. They, this isn't something they want to be in the business of doing. Yeah. But I found a company that makes poker chips. I got them to make me a pretty accurate set. And then they sat in these poker chip holders for years because I couldn't think of what case to put them in. And then I was watching Rounders and I was thinking, if you've seen Rounders, John Malkovich is the big villain and he plays a character named Teddy KGB, who's a Russian mobster poker player. And he has an underground poker club. And I thought to myself, what would Teddy KGB store his poker chips in? Obviously, in the club, he's behind the, in the lockbox, right? Behind a wire mesh, and you give him 10 grand, and he gives you a tray. But, like, if he has to transport those chips, what would they transport in? And that was the idea that I, that, that galvanized my brain to solve this problem. And I'm really excited about the poker chip carrier I made. But I have a question for our Russian-speaking designers uh, who listen to test it. And that is, I want some marks on the outside of this box. I want one mark I want to be like the letter G. Like uh, if you had these boxes that would travel to home games, let's say you'd have six of them, A, B, C, D, E, F, mm -hmm. G. I right? want it to be one in a series. In a series. So I'd want a big... Now, my first question is, do Russians alphabet... Do they, do they delineate things like that with the alphabet like we uh -huh. do in the U.S.? They probably do, but I don't know. Cyrillic is really different, right? Um, then I want to have written in Cyrillic how much how many chips there are in there. I think it's $98,000 and change in, in the stated values on the chips. But then I want a symbol on it that delineates it as from Teddy KGB's place. And I'm not sure what that symbol is. I know that Russian gangsters have the litany of their lives written on their bodies in tattoos. But I'm not sure if it's reasonable for me to take a tattoo design for mm. like a gambler right. and put it on a box. So I'm just curious from the, from the r folks who know Russia, Russian culture, specifically Russian gangster culture, can help me out with websites that might guide me or symbology that might help me to put the symbology on this. It still it has some to have story to tell. It specific meaning. It just needs no. to evoke all the sensibilities well, I don't, of a brand or of... I could grab some random Cyrillic letters and that would work yeah. for most people, but I want this... I want this to have a specific effect on anybody that looks on it, that it tells a story. So if a Russian person looked at it, they'd be like, oh, that's interesting. Now, I don't want the marking to be so accurate <laughs> that I might run into trouble with the Russian mob in San Francisco. I don't even know if there is a Russian mob in San Francisco, <laughs> but I'm assuming there is. I don't want to run into trouble with anybody. Big trouble. Maybe no, China. no, I don't want that. <laughs> but I want, like, uh, again... We will do a show and tell about this because I want to do a call to action to our Russian speaking uh, contingent because I'm really curious about this. Teddy KGB is an amazing character. I know that his accent is ridiculous <laughs> and yet it's very evocative and delightful. Well, you're playing the production designer tasked with, you know, with building a prop right. after reading the script. I am making a canon. I'm, I'm making a piece that is from the from the canon that's not from the film. That's right. And you're looking for the art department graphic designer that a production designer would work with yeah. to create all the decals and the, the stencils and, for this. Yeah. And there's no, then there's no uh, graphic iconography in the film in KGB's place and right. Teddy's place. Well, we were talking earlier about like Eastern promises. That's a huge part of the movie is the, is the tattoos and the story that they tell. And Vigo's tattoos, yeah. right? Vigo Mortensen has that great story. He tells yeah. of going to a restaurant after shooting before removing his visible mm -hmm. tattoos and he goes to eat in a Russian restaurant in London and everyone gets quiet and he realizes, oh, I'm such an asshole. They think I'm some big gangster because yeah. they can see the... What I did yeah. here on my neck. Yeah. Um. 
Um, so yeah, like Eastern Promises is a great movie that plays with that iconography mm -hmm. a lot. I, I still need some, I have some work to do to get this box across the line. I also like line. that you've appropriately teased it where you've, you haven't actually described the box. I'm really curious for listeners out there what they think your interpretation of that box yeah. looks like. I am curious and too. And if you want to draw it out, sketch it out and post it on Twitter, that'd be really fun. Um, yeah. Know that, yeah, I thought about this box for years. I thought about a container for chips for years before alighting on this. And I didn't just for a, as a tease, I didn't travel too far afield. I'll just say it that way. I'm curious because there's I, I've witnessed this kind of happen where like I'll come in after the weekend and you're like pulled something out that you're working on that, that I, you're like, I haven't touched this in 10 years. What what causes you to pick up a project that you've had in the back of your mind? Like, do you see a movie or you hear something like what's what's the catalyst to pick something up that you've been thinking about for a long time? It's really it's. Um, for the poker chips, uh, it starts, I, I can only give this, I'll give this specific example and then I'll give a general example. For this, um, we're, we've been, my boys have left the house in the last couple of years. And so there's been a set of stages of kind of reclaiming <laughs> the part of the house they lived in for us and for guests. So we've been kind of moving through that part of our house and, uh, sorting basically mm -hmm. getting rid of closets full of trash and kid stuff and uh organizing parts of our house and my wife and i played uh uh we had a hold a texas hold'em game for about three or four years back in the early aughts when we were first together um, we played every sunday with the same group of friends for years and we played so seriously i actually had a full set of poker chips made for our game wow. Wow. called sunday night and they had different delineations on them i chose colors very specifically and i had a thousand poker chips for that and they sat in this big case when you buy a thousand poker chip case it's not the best made case and this one is now 14 years old and it's really long in the tooth and it's heavy and dumb. Mm -hmm. So I bought a better poker chip carrier for it. And when I did and I got it, I was like, oh, this is a nice design. It's nicer than I thought it was. Ah, maybe it's time for me to revisit the rounders box. So that was the first part. And then was like flipping through the movies yesterday. Oh, so that's the gen that's the specific answer. That's how I got to mm -hmm. being interested in this. But then on the weekends, I try not to make a lot of plans on the weekends. Um, they really, they really are time for me and Julia and the dogs to just chill in the house uh, or take the dogs to the park. I spend a lot of time on the weekends having downtime, but that also means that there might be times in the weekend where like, we're just sort of hanging out and like, eh, I feel like going to the shop and just looking around. And so I did that yesterday. I came to the shop and I started something and there was too many problems to solve with the thing that I was thinking I wanted to work on. And I ended up putting everything back away and went back to the house after like 40 minutes. Hmm. And then we were watching some television. We made some dinner, we made an early dinner. And then I put on the television. And as I was flipping through stuff to watch, I came across Rounders, which I had watched uh -huh. half of about six months ago. And I watched the finale of Rounders. And I was like, what would Teddy store his chips in? Oh, it was like, it's usually a question that elicits a story in my head. Mm. Once I have a, a, a question that elicits a whole levels, levels of stories, what would Teddy store his chips in? What, how would they get used? How would they move? How would they be cataloged? Who would need to know? What is the infrastructure this is a part of? That's where I get excited. And mm -hmm. then I came back and knocked out this poker chip carrier in like three hours flat. So did it come to you almost fully formed at that, like that moment? Um, uh, I'd say about 75%. Okay. And uh, so then I sit there and when I'm working on a project like that, that's super free form and I haven't even done any drawings. Yeah. Uh, it's usually like solve the problem I know yeah. while thinking about the problems I don't. So the chips sit on the thing. Okay, they sit on the thing. Okay, they're going to sit this high. I don't know how high that's going to be. So I'm just going to make it ever overly long and then I'll sort of pare it down. And it was this process of doing that. And it's all um, all plywood construction. So now in the shop, as you've seen, Jen, we, we've, we've, uh, we've gone with using every thickness of super high quality plywood. So I have like 16th inch that's like five ply mm -hmm. and eighth inch that's like 11 ply. And like 
that allows me a freedom of construction because everything's going to be really so rigid still, yeah. and uh, mm. easy to attach, easy to glue. And mm. it, the finish is great, as you see, just matte black spray paint mm. that looks really great. Yeah. It we'll do a show like until this week. We I totally promise. will. Yeah, yeah. You'll see that soon on the site. I also feel like this project was the low hanging fruit in a list of projects since you had. No, you want to not tackle the other project. Yeah, yeah. Right, there's, right. there's a lot of little things going on. So sometimes it's what I can get done in an afternoon. Sometimes I just really want to finish something in an afternoon. Mm. And weirdly, here during the weekdays, I'm doing much more infrastructural kind of stuff. So it's those occasional, after, occasional afternoons on the weekends where sometimes I have the most sort of fun. Yeah, I've noticed that sometimes I'll, if I'm procrastinating on something else I'm supposed to be doing, I'll do something fun and creative just to put off the task that I'm supposed to be working yeah. on. I'm a big believer that that is a huge galvanizer of enthusiasm and energy towards getting mm -hmm. something done. Yeah, and there's like, it's lower stress because there's not a deadline and there's not the, the yeah. pressure of I have to do this now. It's like, I just want to do this. It's fun because I feel like doing it. And it reminds you what's fun about yeah. using these things we have at the end of our arms. <laughs> That's a good place that to was stop. A, that was longer than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jen, for joining us this week. Um, we hope you all out there have uh, had a good Thanksgiving holiday if you celebrated that. And uh, we'll be back next week with more stuff. I can't wait. One more episode of Watchmen. Uh, wait, no. no one, we'll, be, we'll have another episode of Watchmen to digest in next week's episode. Yes. Two more episodes, I think. Uh, and then season. we'll have to do a full spoiler. I think full we'll spoiler to, cast. 100%. Of Watchmen yeah. and Mandalorian. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. I'll keep my ears closed for both of those. <laughs> <laughs> All, right, All right. See you then. Thanks, everybody.